This morning I'd like to talk a bit about unity. That's a big subject in the world nowadays, especially. Uh, the world talks a lot about unity. They encourage us to come together and just get along and things like that. And all of it sounds well and good, but to be completely honest, I think a lot of times their view of coming together uh, comes at the expense of our morals, where come together to some means let's just be united and don't be dividing over telling me that I'm sinful and what I'm doing is wrong, things like that. And so I think there's an effort out there to try to corner the church uh, because if you stand firm in God's word and if you say we can't be united under sinful things, well then you're, you're called divisive and things like that. But unlike the world, the Bible tells us that we can experience true unity if it is rooted in Christ. From the beginning of time, uh, groups of people have fought against each other. There have been battles and wars. And as I sat down to think about this, it occurred to me that I really couldn't think of many really good examples where enemies had actually reconciled and come together for the long term. The best example that I can come up with, and maybe you can come up with a better one, is in the aftermath of the Civil War. If you recall, the Northern Union forces defeated the Southern Confederates, and uh, they kept the, the North winning the war kept the South from breaking away and forming its own nation, which is what they wanted to do. Now, I think most people nowadays, when they think of the Civil War, they tend to gravitate towards that issue of slavery, and that was a significant reason for the war. But I think relatively few people know what happened after the war. Uh, the Union general was Ulysses S. Grant, and the Confederate general was Robert E. Lee. Grant went on to become the 18th president of the United States, and in, as president, he strived to achieve unity uh, in several areas. He demanded that the former Confederate troops uh, be treated fairly. He demanded that freed slaves be treated fairly. And he demanded that American Indians be treated fairly. The Confederate general, on the other hand, Robert E. Lee, in recent years has become the target of a lot of hatred. And it was, I don't really know what brought all this up. It was just, uh, you know, several, a few years back. Uh, and first of all, I certainly don't defend his acceptance of the institution of slavery at all. But I ask you, does that one issue that a person stands for, uh, does that define a person's life? I hope it doesn't because I don't think any of us would want to be hated for one position that we held or one decision that we made. So again, just a few years back, uh, there you saw on the news, people were tearing down all these statues. People who were, uh, they thought were related to the Confederate cause or accused of being racist and things like that. And Robert E. Lee statues were no, no exception. And I do think it was a bit unfair given what was going on because nobody when that was going on, nobody talked about what he did after the war, how he made serious and significant efforts to restore order and unity in this nation, despite being a Southerner who was on the losing cause. And he, um, he encouraged his fellow Southerners to submit to national authority. And he also encouraged them to live in harmony. And I just think if he was as bad as everyone says he was, I doubt he would have done that. But statues aside and all that, both Grant and Lee both worked after the war for a united nation, uh, even though they opposed each other on the battlefield. And their efforts were not in vain because we're still the United States of America. We have even more states than we did when the Civil War took place. I do know nowadays some people wonder how strong our unity is. Some suggest it might be more tenuous than we want to admit. But regardless, the Bible tells us that we can experience a certain unity in our lives that can never be destroyed by wars as long as it's rooted in Jesus Christ. 
So to that end, let's uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 2 if you're following in your Bibles, and we will read from verse 8 through 18, reading out of the New International Version. The Apostle Paul writes, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and are called uncircumcised by those who call them the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were, who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. So with the time that we have together this morning, I'd like to unpack a little of what Paul writes here and make better sense of it. Um, there's an awful lot that could be said in just about any one verse of, of uh, Ephesians for sure, but we're taking about 11 verses here in about 25 minutes or so, so we understand where we're coming from here. But first of all, he talks about circumcision. Hopefully we all know what that is. And in the days of Jesus, only the Jewish people were practicing it. And it served as a physical identifying mark of a Jewish man. And throughout the years, it had become, uh, they had begun referring to themselves by this identifying mark. They called themselves the circumcision. And anyone who didn't have it, who wasn't a Jewish man, was called the uncircumcision. And, th and so it sort of, through the years, took on a life of its own. They took being circumcised so seriously that if a Jewish man would marry a Gentile or a non-Jewish woman, for instance, the family would hold a funeral service to symbolize the death of their child, even though, not, of course, they're still alive. It was that bad to be associated with uncircumcised or unclean people. And that's something, by the way, not in the scriptures, not in the Bible, but it's something that sort of came about through the years. The best I can relate it to would be maybe in the 20th century, even our modern day, maybe if a white family would have their white son marry a black woman, and they would just be so dead set against an interracial marriage that they would hold a funeral service and say, he's dead to us, you know, we have no, nothing to do with that union. It's just how deep-rooted this animosity and hatred between the Jews and the Gentiles was. To me, it sort of sounds like things we would do back in school, you know. I don't know if you remember back in your days, Seems like there's a lot of cliques going on. You, know, you had this group of people that hung out together because of shared interest, and maybe some of them, they didn't really care for the jocks because they were popular, and maybe you just honestly were a little uh, jealous of their popularity, so we really don't associate with them. We also don't really care for the really smart kids because they're sort of the curb busters, you know? Uh, they make my grades look a little worse. And I don't want to be a part of sort of the nerd crowd because, you know, they're, you know, they're the nerds. And so it's this us versus them mentality. And uh, so uh, anyway, they, the Jewish people, they didn't quite have like a secret handshake or a secret password or something like you might have on a playground. But it, 
almost sort of got close to that kind of exclusivity, though. But here's the thing. It was never supposed to be that way. Bible scholar Warren Wearsby reminds us that God established this covenant of circumcision way back with Abraham, 4,000 or so years back from where we are right now. But God didn't establish it this so that his people could walk around holding their heads high like they're better than everybody else. If you read the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis 12, he says, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And through the years, that's the exact opposite of what happened. They weren't being a blessing all that often to people who weren't like them. And so circumcision was supposed to represent a heart that was devoted to God. But even before Jesus, in the days of Jeremiah, Jeremiah talked about this. He pointed out there was a problem with the way that many of them were acting. In chapter 4 of his very long book, he says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem lest my wrath go forth as fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. So in other words, he's saying God cares more about your hearts than some physical act that you've done to your body, even if I've commanded you to do it. See, many had the mark, but they didn't have the heart. And if you fast forward to the uh, Gospels, in John 10, some Jewish leaders went to Jesus one time. And they said to him, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Well, you know what Jesus said to that? He said, I told you and you did not believe. The, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. So in other words, if you were following God, as you should be, as evidenced by this circumcision that you have had done to you, then it should be obvious that I am who I said I am, but you still don't believe me. So what does that say about you? And I'm talking about this today because I really don't know how many modern day Christians realize why we call ourselves Christians, why we don't call ourselves Jews, why we go to a church and we don't go to a temple and things like that. It was because God's own people rejected him through his Messiah, Jesus Christ. So God opened it up to use the whole, the whole world to reach people for the kingdom of God, not just one nation anymore. And that's where we come in. We are the Gentiles. We are the non-Jews. And the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's plan caused the problems that Paul was addressing in Ephesians, for instance. Some Jews didn't want to let go of the way things were. And they were so used to circumcision being a command that the Bible talks about a debate that they had among themselves. Should this be commanded or not? And in Acts 15, you can read about that, but I'll just give you a little bit here. It says, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, this is all that there is to it here. Uh, that there is, since God's vehicle to reach the world was now expanded to the whole world, there's no need for a distinguishing mark anymore. And that's when Peter stood up and he responded this way. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the through grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will, meaning they being the Gentiles. And it wasn't only Peter who spoke up in Acts 15. James, he had something to say, too. He said, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled and from blood. So he's saying it's not so much this mark they have to get. They need to be, uh, they need to be morally upright and not sinning all the time. That's the important thing. 
Now, I'm going to assume everybody here is familiar with the board game Monopoly. It's one of the most popular games in the history of the world. And do you know that there are different rules for playing Monopoly? Uh, early on, some of the original uh, packages had a rule book, and uh, some people went by the rules. Then through the years, some people established what we call house rules. We'll play it this way, you know, because it's a little more fun or, you know, changes things around. So maybe you're familiar with uh, the version of the game where if you have to pay taxes or fees, instead of paying it to the banker, like the rule book says, you put it in the middle of the board. And hopefully, to make it a little more interesting and fun, uh, that pile is going to increase. And when someone finally lands on free parking, which normally is more like a dead space, well, you land on free parking, you get all that money. Makes it a little more exciting. But that's one of the house rules that sort of came about. And there's even speed up versions of the game where after you give everyone their money, you take the, uh, all the property cards, you shuffle them, and you just deal them out so that everyone starts with an equal number of properties and you can buy and sell and collect rents and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of different versions to just one board game. Well, in Ephesians 2, you more or less had one group playing by one set of rules and another group playing by another set, and they decided that if we're going to come together and be united, we all have to be playing under the same rules. So are we going to pay our taxes and fees to the banker or put them in the middle of the boards, things like that. So P Peter and James agreed the circumcision is no longer required. You're allowed to do it. It might be a good thing to do health-wise and other reasons, but not a requirement anymore for the reasons that we already mentioned. And it's an important point because if a person insists that God is still going to re require something that he no longer requires, Aren't you going back before the cross and before the resurrection and you are more or less rejecting God's sovereign decision to open up the means of salvation to the entire world? Now, Paul says in verse 14 of that chapter, for he himself is our peace, who has made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now we read that and we think that's an interesting metaphor, the dividing wall of hostility. That's, that's pretty good. Not so much of a metaphor, actually. He was taking that from a physical wall that was inside the uh, parameters of the Jewish temple. You had the outer court for the Gentiles and sort of a short wall that separated. The Jewish people could go through the wall closer to where God was but the Gentiles had to stay out there. Paul is referring to this as a wall of hostility because he had an issue with the wall. There was a time in Acts 21, Paul was falsely accused of bringing a Gentile uh, past the wall into the inner parts. He didn't actually do it, but they took him out ready to kill him. Things because people didn't like Paul, so it's sort of a false accusation, but we can see how things like that that he experienced are influencing his writings too. But Paul is saying, under the way that it is, is now, we need to break down any of these walls that we have built against like-minded people. People are still trying to follow Christ as we are. Can you imagine if we would have a policy or a rule here that anyone who doesn't have an official church membership certificate we're going to keep these doors here open. They're going to sit out there, and they're going to watch the service from there. But if you have the certificate, you can sit in here. We wouldn't put up with that, nor should we. So Paul is saying that if, if you are in Christ, that the walls that separate us need to be broken down. We are all together as long as we are believing and following and doing the things that we should do. And, and the whole reason for this change is what Paul writes about in verse 15. He says it was done to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. Again, unity if we put it in other terms. The old way, people just create a division out of it, but God's ultimate goal is to create peace and unity among his people. 
and he does so by creating this new humanity or this new man, what the, how the, the NIV puts it. And then in verse 16, he says this happened in one body to reconcile both the Jews and Gentiles to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Again, his goal, God's goal, is to bring unity, bring people together under his saving grace. It's exactly what Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. If you ever want to know, how should I pray? Read John 17. The whole chapter is Jesus' prayer. And if anyone knew how to pray, it was our Lord Jesus. And so he prayed, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Unity, he wants the Jews and Gentiles to come together. And that's being partially fulfilled until the day when he comes and we see the complete fulfillment. So the first value that I see in a study in just a small portion of scripture such as this is first of all appreciating where we as Gentiles come from. How God opened up the opportunity for Gentiles to serve him and preach the word to all nations. We are not second-class citizens. Uh, we are equal citizens in the kingdom of God as part of the new humanity. And second-class, or, or you know, uh, the second value that I see concerns the covenant that God made to Abraham. When he said, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. The blessing first ran through God's people through that one nation. And then now it runs through this new humanity, this new blending in of the two groups together, as Paul puts it. It doesn't exclude Jewish people. It doesn't exclude Gentiles. It includes both groups together provided that they have faith in Jesus Christ. That's the important thing. And over in Galatians 3, Paul writes more about it. He writes, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Genesis 12 applies to us now as well non-Jewish people who are seeking to serve God and to follow Jesus Christ. So I ask you, what do you do as a member of God's new humanity? Um, are you doing your best to separate yourself from the other sinners out there so we don't get tainted with uh, all their evil? Or are we going to do our best to be a blessing to anyone out there regardless of their faith in an effort to bring them into the family and the kingdom of God as well? So the best way I think to be a blessing is to start by treating people fairly and then point them towards Christ. And I remind you that our Gentile ancestors they weren't always treated fairly in the church. That's what, why Paul had to write Ephesians. There were people weren't treating them fairly. So why would we want to go and perpetuate that same behavior on other people? And so as I close, I just hope that we realize that none of us have a perfect understanding of the scriptures. The Jewish people in, in Acts and in Ephesians, they thought they knew it all. And Peter had to stand up and James had to stand up and say, this is where you're wrong. And hopefully we're all doing our best to interpret the Bible. Just as, going back to the beginning, Robert E. Lee, he said, he walked around and said, I'm a Christian and I have slaves and I think slavery is fine. He interpreted the Bible in a different way. I can't speak to the reality of his faith, but... Uh, part of being saved is uniting with believers, even when we disagree on sort of secondary details. Things like what music do we sing in church? What mode of baptism do we use? Do we dunk people one time or three times or anything like that? A number of other things. If you name it, we can divide over it. But we need to focus on the redeeming qualities of people that we might have disagreements with. Maybe they'll change their position. Maybe you'll change your position. Maybe we'll just stay here and here 
but agree to disagree. That's possible too. But part of Christ's work on the cross was to put to death their hostility, which is what is written in the scriptures, resulting in this new humanity. And the Holy Spirit, um, in Acts, there was a Jew named Peter and another one named James who were willing to stand up for what was right. And another Jewish man, Paul, he was willing to explain in the scriptures what this new humanity is. They saw the right path and they did what they could to point people towards it. The new humanity is the way that God established by which we can be blessed by God and be a blessing to others. So let us bow our heads and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Ephesians and Acts and all these other passages that we've mentioned. It's hard to look at just one in sort of a vacuum because it all, all the scripture plays off of itself. But we see how you have called us to be a new humanity. We are brother, equal brothers with uh, any Jewish person who believes in Christ and with anyone of a different nationality who believes in Christ or of a, you know, men and women, uh, black and white, different races, all those things. We see how the world tries to use those things to divide us, but in Christ we can truly be united doesn't mean we're going to agree on every single little point. It would be great if we did, and one day we will. But for now, we pray that we would keep focus on you in the work that you've called us to do. We thank you for that call in our lives, and we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.